New York is where they came from, and New York is really insane. And so a friend of mine and I got on a Greyhound bus one Saturday and went to New York to see what they were talking about. The store was called Times Square Records. And it was a little tiny store that was like pff, 20 by 20. You couldn't even get in the door. And it was I remember the day you, had, you couldn't get in. It was just the tiniest place, but there was music blasting out of the speaker, something I never heard of. And it was the harmony stuff. And um, you couldn't get in the store until somebody left. So we, there was a line of people waiting to get in, but yeah, somebody had to come out before you can get in. And so I w finally got in there, and it was like walls and walls and walls. It was a dump. It was a dump. I patterned this place after it, but anyway, it's a bigger dump. So those records, you know, I I never heard of any of the records, and they got records on the wall for five dollars, ten dollars, eight dollars, twenty dollars. I said, what is this? Why why would anybody pay more than a dollar for a record? This is stupid. Because well, even the record that. museum sold them for a dollar in wow. Philadelphia. Yeah. Two dollars, five dollars, and I see people spending the money. So I took paper and I started writing the wall down. You know, Mexico by the Rocket Tones, twenty dollars. What is that? You know, where, where, you know, I, I just because they were written on sleeves. You, you didn't see the label, but there, everything was pinned onto a, this board behind everything. I don't know what this is. None of these records. I never heard of any of them. You know, and so I wrote it down, and then I would go looking. I came back to Philly. I bought a few things that I heard, like what what they were playing in the store, that which were a dollar each. Like the first record I bought was called "I Can't Believe" by Dino and the Diplomats, which was blasting and blasting and blasting outside while we waited. It was the top record on a stack of records on a record player that was you hear the needle go, shh, then start again. Shh. They put just enough on that it would continue to play. And I first thing I said when I did get in there is, what is that record playing? They didn't even know what I was talking about. I said, no, 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 where, what record? What are you talking about? The record that, if you go outside, you'll hear it because it's been playing for the last 20 minutes. So it, they came back, oh, it's this. They looked at the record player. I said, well, I want that. It's a dollar. And I, that became like, oh my God, this is so, you know, so that's yeah. how it started. So then we go up there every weekend. And, you know, every other weekend, whatever I could afford, bus was, we wound up by bus, it was like $5 round trip then to go to New York. And we would come back with, Bob, this is my friend Bob Campbell and I, and we'd sit in the back of the bus, we'd be coming, coming home at, you know, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, just sitting there with our five records each. You know, we had no money, but we would just, it would be like we're bring, bringing gold back because these records are so different. So then I started going, well, both of us went all over the city looking for old records that were on that list. And so we would find, I mean, we learned that you, you grab anything that ends in S, a group record, and we were taking chances because everything was a nickel, dime, 20 cents, 15 cents. Stores sold records. This is in the early 60s where you could go to John's Bargain Store. Everything was eight cents. They would buy dumps of records and put them out on the table because everybody liked records then. Lit Brothers over 10 cents. We, you know, Grant's five and 10 downtown, 10 cents. You know, uh, there was HL Greens, which were, you know, four for a dollar. I mean, I know where they were. We went there on a regular basis all over the place. And we went to record shops and we went, every place you went, there was always a table of crap that nobody wanted. That's what we wanted. The stuff that nobody ever heard of. Um, then, then guess what happened? The place went out of business. It went out in 1965, like the summer of 65. And we used to love going up there and I had knew him, I knew the owner, I knew every the people that worked, I met a lot of people there. Yeah. It was so much fun. So now, now what? The place went out of business. So here's what happened. By then I'm selling records to my friends, basically my friends. I would go to see my mother in Kentucky and I'd stop all the way down any record shop that might have stuff and I found great records, real cheap, and I would bring them up here and I'd sell them for five dollars, you know, same thing they were doing. So. In 1966, which is exactly 50 years ago now, this is January of, 60, of uh, 2016, so 50 years ago, this month, I decided to put out a list of records to people. A friend of mine was doing it in Philly. He, his name was Mike Adler. He had a company called JMB Records. I used to go up there and buy tons of records from him. It was only just vocal groups. And he wasn't, he, you know, he was, he was, the guy who had it all after Slim went, he be, he became really big. To I mean, as far as I know, anyway. All I know is I would go up there, and he would he would his mother was his, would would take the money, and his and he was younger than me. I didn't even know this at the time. I would give him a thousand dollars worth. I give him a thousand dollars in checks when I was making fifty dollars a week, and it was taking me. My car was costing me twenty five a week to keep it moving. You know, so I was. But I would ten dollars a week. I gave 
tr checks for ten dollar checks. I would just give them books of things, just put them in whenever. And she worked with me, and that, it's like that's how I lived. And then uh, uh, let's see, that was sixty. Okay, so then what happened was he wanted to get out of this. He wanted to get into LPs. Plus, he was selling. I, I don't want to get into the drugs, but he was mm. somehow he was involved with drugs. I think I don't know, but more, much more money in drugs and records. I never went home. I never dated. I never. I, I didn't have a life for all those years. And then um, in 1972, I went to see my mother in Kentucky and my father. My father died two years later. But my mother and father, and I took a guy from England that I was friendly with who was coming over here buying a lot of records. I said, look, let's go down south. I'll take you down south and we'll find records like I always do. So this is the first time that I ever didn't want to go back to work because I hit this place in Nashville that everybody had been in and remember I knew all about current music because that's what I did I sold current I was a buyer for current music mostly black so I'm into so we went to Nashville and I'm with this guy and he wants 78s and he wants things I didn't take somebody with with me that was into what I'm into he was into rockabilly and blues and everything but you can't you can't like groups if you like groups you can't go with me you know I don't want to fight with you so he said no I don't want that crap so anyway, we go there, and this is another life-changing moment. What happened was this one, young girl was in there running the store, and somebody came in, and, and my friend's in the back looking for 78s. And I said, come on with the crap. We could go someplace that has records. You know, let's get out of here, please. I'm yelling all this stuff. And so he's back there. He goes, Give us a... so the woman, so while we're there, while I'm there, I'm talking to her because she knows singers, and I know a lot about all kinds of music. I was grew up with this so she's telling me that she's friendly with Skeeter Davis and she knows Farron Young and these are all records these are records that I bought when I was a kid and I like country too I like all kinds of music you know not just the groups but everybody thinks it's just groups I like but I like it all so almost all so um, anyway we're talking and somebody came in off the street for a current record and she didn't know what it was so I said it's on Mercury it's uh, and she goes wow I just got a shipment from them hold on and makes the sale so she says how did you know that I said because I do sort of what you do in Philadelphia. I said, I work for a distributor, a one-stop, which sells everything, and I buy all this stuff, and, you know, that's what I do. I know all that. That's what I, that's what I do for a living. So she was, she said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, my mother lives in Kentucky, and I'm down here looking for records, old records, unknown records. And then we got into that, and she says, you know what? She said, there's two floors upstairs that nobody's ever been in. It's all filled with records. You want to go up there and look? I said, are you serious? She goes, yeah. What are you paying? I said, what do you want me to pay? And she goes, tell me something. I said, how about a quarter apiece? She goes, have fun. So she says, just make sure you don't fall through the floor. So because there's, it's like cardboard. You know, you could go right through the, the it was, you got to go where there's beams. You can't, otherwise you'll go right through the drop ceiling. So we're up there and I'm like, finding records that only, by then I knew, I'm starting to really understand. This is 1972, summer of 72. That changed my life because I filled up the car. I got her to stay till like 10 o'clock. We bought her food. I took her home. We threw her in the back on top of the records. You know, I drove her home because the bus, whatever, the transportation stopped. I mean, it was just a wild night. In 1970, I was buying records for crazy money from people. I was, and, I, and people were calling up saying, you know, uh, what are you doing with these records? Why, why are these records worth hundreds of dollars now? You know, and I was sort of, not controlling it. There was somebody else. I had friends of mine in California that were doing what I was doing, and we were friends. And between the two of us, we were the game with these old records, with the group records. And so, and I collected. They didn't. They just sold records. I bought from them. I bought things I needed, and I would wholesale them. And we had a good relationship. And we went on vacation in 1975, I think, 74. 70, Chuck, Chuck would know better than me. Oh, I went. We went away on a cruise. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, Patty, and uh, his their wives, the six of us went away for a week or whatever, ten days, two weeks, I don't know. And um, before I went away, I was interviewed by a guy from Detroit about two re about some records that I bought from somebody. I went to Detroit and I bought uh, a couple of records for eight hundred dollars, two records off of somebody for eight hundred dollars, which was and it's got out there that I did that, and. Um, this guy calls up and he says, what, what, what are you doing? And he, he, he's a writer for a newspaper. And he says, um, you know, what, records are worth that kind of money and all. And I did, spent a lot of time with him. And I said, um, and he said, look, can I send a photographer there from 
the local paper to take a picture. Why don't you bring in your two rarest records and we'll take a picture? And I says, all right. So uh, he came here and I was holding these records. One was like a thousand dollars and one was eight hundred or whatever. I don't know. So took this picture and I said, do me a favor. When this thing comes out, send me a copy of this. I'd like to have it. I'd see it or whatever. So I didn't hear anything and that was the end of that. So we go, I go, and that was months, you know, maybe three, four months. And I forgot about it almost immediately. I go away on this cruise with these guys and come back and I go to my, go to the mailbox and I used to get like 15, 20 letters a day. Orders were in there and requests for, you know, I've always made it, my want list is how I do business. You tell me what you want. I don't tell you. I mean, at the time I did lists. But all that's going to change in, with this story I'm going to tell you. We go on this cruise. I come back to the post office. I've been away two weeks. The store wasn't open. If I went someplace, the store was closed. Come back, and there's no mail in my box. So I go up to the window. I says, yo, how can I be going two weeks and there's no mail? And he says, he's here. They start yelling, he's here, he's here. I said, what are you talking about, he's here? And they say, you want your mail? Come here. They open this door to the back of the post office and there's like these plastic trays that are this long with paper and there's like 20, stack 20, 10 height, there's two rows, three rows, whatever. It's all, they said, there's your mail. I said, what? What? Why? You know, and I'm like, I had to make five trips to get all the mail. I had to put it all in my car and I, I'll bring the, the case. I bring it all in here and the phone's ringing off the hook. And it's like, you know, what, what is going on? I, and I start opening the mail up and they're all the same thing. It says this, please send your latest catalog, you know, Joe Schmo, blah, 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 blah. Please send Chively's latest catalog. What is this? What is, and then the phone, I finally take a phone call because it's like, I don't know what I'm walked into. This is crazy. It's between the mail and the phones are red on. You know, it's just ringing, ringing, ringing. So this woman, I answer the phone, this lady says to me, so you're a millionaire, huh? And I said, what are you talking about? Who is this? And she goes, I just read this article about you. It's in the paper and it says you make millions of dollars a day and you, you do it all this stuff with records and blah, 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 blah. And I said, where did you read this? National Enquirer. What? So I go down the street, I go, you know, and she's telling me that you, she's a hooker. She's telling me, you know, get with me, honey, and you'll forget all about those records. She goes, We're, I'm in Philly. You know, you're in Philly. That's why I called. I, I need to see you, honey. You're going to forget those records. You want to see what I look like? Get over here. So I says, no, 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 no. So I ended up going down the street, getting this magazine, and it really freaked me out. It's a picture of me holding my records. I don't, ah, that's how I look. He sold that article to the National Enquirer, and it says that I make millions of dollars that all this stuff, everybody's got records that are worth millions of dollars and they're all sitting in their basements and all you have to do is get Shively's latest catalog. It's free. It doesn't say free, but it is free. All you have to do and you'll find out what you're, that you're sitting on a gold mine. Well, I got like half a million letters probably all together from all this and I ended up hiring all these people to write postcards back to them. I wasn't going to take this. I mean, I broke up with my girlfriend because she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm selling catalogs. I don't care about records anymore. This is unbelievable what's happened to me. I mean, I, you know, I turned around and I bought all the postcards I could get. I bought every every post office out. I rubber, rubber stamp. It says the following, the, the, the catalog you requested, this is what it wrote. Know it by heart. We'll always remember this. The catalog you requested is available for three dollars. It lists over 15,000 records and their values. Make checks payable to Val Shively. And, but then I'm getting all these letters that are saying, I have all these 78s of uh, Al Jolson and all. Well, I don't want the people's three dollars if they don't have anything I want. And I'm, this isn't a scam. I didn't ask for this article to be out there. They call me up, they're gonna sue me because they found out I'm selling the catalog for three dollars. It's supposed to be free. I said, let me tell you, it cost me a buck a piece to make them. And I gotta sit here, I got all these people I hired to do all this crap. And you're telling me you're gonna sue me? I should sue you. Who gives you the right to do to, 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 to put my name in here, I'm going to hear from the IRS, I'm sure, who's going to tell me you make millions of dollars. How come the returns don't show that at all? You know, all this stuff. So I'm worried, but I'm doing this thing. And then I had this other stamp made, not interested in 78s or records before 1950. You know, boom, boom, boom. And here comes all the $3. Now the mail's still coming in like crazy because now it's all the $3 checks. And there's thousands and thousands and th hundreds of thousands of them. So I ended up, that took, 
I mean, I still get letters. That was in 1974. I still get people saying, please send Shabby's latest catalog. Like, where did you get this? They're still reading the National Enquirer. It was the most amazing thing I ever saw in my life. Changed my life. Never did another catalog. And that was the end. So then I just, now it's a joke. Everything is like, and I'm getting records from my collection like crazy because the back of it's got my one list and they're, they're, they're so that was the end of that. The best story of them all is a guy that used to call here uh, for, uh, and he's still with us. He still buys from us. He's like, you know, but this is the sickest one of them all. Um, calls up one day and he goes, do you have a song? Uh, you know, I guess I answered, I, or Chuck did, I don't even know. This is in the 70s, I think. Uh, it was, uh, do you have Moonlight Feels Right by Starbuck or whatever it is? So I said, um, uh, yeah, we got it. And he goes, how much is it? I said, uh, two dollars probably right chuck what's that moonlight feels right two dollars probably was a buck back a then. buck maybe a buck so anyway so the guy goes do you think you have five copies i says yeah yeah we got five so i guess he came in and got him right did yeah. they do it by mail came in it was five five calls up the next day hello i said yeah help you yeah do you have a song called don't worry about all that the whole thing collapsed do you have moonlight feels right by uh you know that song I says yeah he goes how many do you have I says I don't know how many you want he goes do you think you have five and I could have said hey moron you called here yesterday but I didn't so anyway uh, that went on for months every day five 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 sold out of it you know and then I called my friend down there you know that had the house of sounds or whatever and I said look uh, I need uh, 200 copies of this moonlight why you want that piece of crap I said, because I got a moron that wants to buy everyone that was ever made, apparently. So he sells me uh, 200 of them for a quarter, I guess, you know, $50, but, you know, whatever. I, by then, it was probably $2. Who knows? All I know is I sold a lot of that record. People used to come in and interview me. I'd say, what's the biggest older you got? I says, forget it. It's Moonlight Feels Right. Nobody buys like that. I mean, that's that's our hot number one record forever. So one day, the door opens, and this woman walks in older woman and she got bags and bags of records so i go can i help you you buy records i said yeah i guess what do you got and i go up and i look and they're all moonlight feels right i said oh no <laughs> oh no so i bought them all back like a moron so um and then you know i just assumed he died the husband and and it turns out that he didn't because about a month later hi do you have Moonlight Feels Right? I said, I sure do. So he said, yeah, how many do you have? I says, well, I got at least five. I was going to say 500. But anyway, uh, so that went on again for a while. Now, he's still buying. Yeah, in fact, it, this is true. I think Chuck just told me, we called you yesterday, and I think he asked for Moonlight Feels Right. I mean, he's in a nursing home, and he's still buying that record. So um, that you ask about people that are into things. People are into everything. And I deal with wackos. But then somebody could hear me and say, whoa, 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 he's as whacked as the rest of them. I agree. And, uh, you know, I, I was married to this mostly. This has been my life. This was what I did. I mean, I, get married, I got married when I was 46 years old because I never had time for girls or never women or relationships because this is what I did 24-7. I did it, uh, you know, I was always going places, doing things, running here, running there, running to New England, running, you know, always buying records. One day uh, in my old store, this truck pulls up, a big dump truck, like where they put asphalt in, in, in holes on the street. And it's it, this old black guy's in the, I mean, he's got his whole family in the, in the truck. And he goes, where's the guy that's buying records? So I said, what do you want him for? I go outside, what do you want him for? So uh, he says, I got more records for him. I, well, they've been bringing records in here for like three weeks with all plaster and broken glass soul records. I was buying all these soul records. I said, and I said to these people, where are you getting these things? Oh, we can get all we want. Well, I said, well, you know, I was buying them cheap. So I bring them in, but I mean, you got to wear the glass all in there. I said, where are these things coming from? They wouldn't tell me. Well, this guy, he had them. He, it was a building collapse and it was records. And it's what mortar. It's 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 everything. It's but it's broken glass. It's everything. And it's he's got a whole thing and he's put him in by shovel. So he says, "What are you paying for records?" And I say, "What do you got?" And he goes, and I go, "Oh no, more of this crap." And he goes, "This is the end of this crap. You know, he's been steal. Everybody's been stealing them because of you know. I this is these are mine." 
So we had this thing, and he didn't have reverse on the truck. So I love this. I would say, he goes, give me a thousand bucks, you can have them all. So I said, are you crazy? You got to give me a thousand dollars for me to take this crap. I said, you know, and then we went, and I would say, see you later, have a great life. I know we ain't going nowhere. So I ended up coming back in here, and then you hear the horn out front. He had to go all the way around the block. He goes, how about 800? I said, how about 200? How about 100? You know, and we ended up, well, I don't know what we did. But anyway, that was insane. It was like crazy. All these things, and that was a good deal because it was all unknown stuff. And I could go on, I could tell you bad deals, I could tell you good deals, but it's always been interesting. Anyway, I want you to go over to this lady. You'll be happy you did. And she's very reasonable. All right. Okay. And she's great. I'll check her Tell out. Tell her the record shop guy sent you. All right. All right? What is your name again? Pardon me? What is your name again? Val. Val. V-A-L. Val. I'll take a Val. Thank All you. Right. See you later. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, somehow I'm still here. All the people that started when I did basically are all gone. There's a few but they all work out of the house and they don't have stores. And I wouldn't have a store if I didn't have so much stuff and it's paid for. So it's, it's like whatever, everything in here is paid for and I own the building. I still have to pay taxes and I still got the government all over me, but you know, this is what I do. And, I, and even if, like my wife wants me to retire, guess what, ain't gonna happen because it's not about the money. I need a place to go. I need, I need my mind has to work, I like this. It keeps me young, it keeps me thinking. I know people half my age who are dead just waiting for The Undertaker. So I need a place to go, even if I'm not making money, because I know too many stories about people who are retired and it's like a month from now, dead. You work your whole life, you, you wait for your retirement and then you're dead. And that's what goes on. So it's like a, a, a bullshit thing that they've, this whole retirement thing, they sell you this plan that, oh, you can spend the rest of your life doing this, traveling, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's fine for somebody, but it ain't good for me. That ain't, that ain't my world.